The regional bank business model is coming under a lot of stress. We've had a real brutal period. We just need to slow down for a little bit. I don't believe they're going to be able to loan money or as much money and therefore we're going to see a natural contraction in the economy. That natural contraction, and he basically said this, is probably another 25 basis points of tightening or maybe even more. So now we've got the Fed doing what they're doing with their 25. We've got the banking community contracting the economy because they no longer have enormous excess deposits to recirculate back into the economy. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David J. Lynch, Global Economics Correspondent here at The Post. My guest today is Gary Cohn, Vice Chairman of IBM, the former Director of the National Economic Council in the Trump Administration. We'll be talking about recent banking failures, the Federal Reserve's fight against inflation, and the outlook for the U.S. economy. Gary, welcome back to Washington Post Live. Thank you, David, and thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I want to start with your view of the Biden administration's response to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, until very recently, this bank had not been regarded as large enough or important enough to the overall financial system to warrant the tightest regulations, the highest capital requirements. But when it suddenly got into trouble, the Biden administration rushed to mount a rescue operation uh, and a quite extraordinary one. Were they right to do so? Would the failure of a bank of this size really have threatened the entire financial system? So, so David, I don't think the issue was Silicon Valley Bank in isolation. I think over that weekend where the FDIC, the Fed, and the Treasury got together and they invoked their systemic risk option, which is was given to them under Dodd-Frank, under their, their resolution authority. I think they were thinking of the entire small and medium-sized banking community as a whole. We were seeing signs, not just at Silicon Valley, we were seeing signs at many small and medium-sized banks of lack of, of, of waning confidence in depositors in those banks and had the, the authorities not stepped in to Silicon Valley Bank, I think we would have seen a massive move of deposits out of small regional and mid-sized banks on the Monday and Tuesday. And we would have seen a horrible issue with liquidity in the United States. And we would have ended up in a situation which is really what the, the Federal Reserve and the regulatory community fears the most, that we would end up with, with a handful of very large banks in the United States because depositors feel safest in those large banks, the, the quote unquote, too big to fail banks. And the last thing that they would have wanted to see is all the money moving from the small and medium sized and the regional banks into the globally systemic banks and the too big to fail banks. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about that issue of banking concentration a, a little bit later. But first, I'm curious where you place the blame uh, for how we got to this point. Uh, obviously, the management of Silicon Valley Bank itself made some very bad and, uh, to my mind, uh, almost inexplicable uh, bets on interest rates. And maybe you can explain uh, to the audience what, uh, what was at issue there. Uh, but regulators apparently had seen some of these problems and had issued warnings uh, to some degree uh, is this a management failure, a supervisory failure, or both? So, so David, you asked a really interesting two-part question, and I want to sort of delve in on both parts of your question. Uh, I'll take the second part first, and then I'm going to go back to the first part of how we got there. So I'll, I'll do it in reverse order. You know, it's very clear to me now that we've seen more of the evidence, 
And we'll continue to see more and more evidence, but we we had two different hearings, a, a Senate hearing and a House hearing this week with the regulators. So now we have more transparency in what was going on at the bank and what was going on in the supervisory community. And it's clear to me that the supervisory community identified the risk. They had elevated it to the bank's management. Bank's management did not follow through, but I'm also gonna criti criticize the, the, the regulators or the, the on-site supervisors. The on-site supervisors should have not allowed bank management to ignore this. I know very well that when I ran a bank, our on-site supervisors, when they issued a, a MRI in bank terms, which is a matter needing immediate attention or, 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 or anything like that, they made sure that bank management was dealing with it in a very speedy fashion. And the on-site regulatory team has enormously broad powers to shut down banks, to go to, 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 to uh, Washington and really impose very stringent restrictions on a bank. Um, as you know, we've seen them impose asset caps on bank. We've, they can threaten to shut you down. So there was um, a management problem here. There was an on-site supervision problem. There was a oversight regulatory problem in the San Francisco Fed. But let's go back to how we got here, because I think it's really important to understand how we got here. You know, we have to go back three years ago. We have to go back to, to, to March of 2020, the beginning of COVID. We were in an environment where if you would pick up any newspaper, if you talk to anyone about what's going on at the Federal Reserve or what's going on in interest rate policy, all of the conversation would be about, will we ever have inflation again in the United States? At the time we had a zero interest rate pol policy and we had the Federal Reserve buying securities, trying to create tighter interest rates, trying to create some tightness in the economy to create inflation because the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate of 2% inflation and full employment. Then lo and behold, we get into this, we get into a pandemic and the government steps in and starts stimulating the economy by providing money to small businesses, providing money to workers to make sure they can live their lives. It's justifiably so but we continue down multiple rounds of stimulus to the point where the US consumer can no longer spend that much money because if we take ourselves back to that period of time, the only place the US consumer could spend money was at the grocery store or anything that the United States Postal Service, UPS or Federal Express could deliver to you. You had no other outlet to spend money. So you weren't needing to borrow any money from the banks. The banks had absolutely no loan growth during this period of time. No one was out buying a house. No one was, was out um, charging on their credit cards. No one was, was using the natural loan demand that exists in the system. And all of a sudden the banks were being flooded with deposits. Money supply grew well over 30% during the pandemic. And so banks are sitting there with all this money on their balance sheet. They don't know what to do with it. There's no natural loan growth. So they start buying US securities um, because it is the least risky asset they can buy. Um, and then, then we get to, to literally a year ago, it was a year ago last March, and we, we, we have inflation. And in the beginning, the Federal Reserve talked about the inflation not being permanent. They talked about it being transitory. They talked about it being, you know, the, 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 the immediate effect of restarting the economy, putting people back to work, getting the supply chain up and going, and then it would quote unquote be transitory and it would disappear quite quickly. Well, the Federal Reserve was wrong. That inflation was not transitory. So the Federal Reserve went on an interest rate raising cycle that has really been quite extraordinary. We went from 0% interest rates in the United States to basically 5% in the course of 12 months. So any bank that bought any treasury securities, which will mature at par because they are the full faith and credit of the United States, they are on a mark to market basis. Those securities are going to lose their money if they have to sell them right now. So banks ended up in this position because of what was happening because of stimulus in the, in the economy. Right. And some banks made more of a mess of it than, than others. And, and we're seeing that in, in Silicon Valley's case. The issue now, of course, is where do we go from here? And as you mentioned, we've had some hearings this week that have uh, begun that conversation. Biden administration officials, including Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, 
are starting to suggest that some additional regulatory uh, efforts uh, might be uh, might be needed, uh, particularly on the mid-sized banks. What do you think uh, the administration should be doing? And are we at the point now where effectively every bank is too big to fail? Well, the, the, the system clearly acted like every bank is too big to fail. And the, the, the regulators clearly got concerned a couple of weeks ago that if we let one small, medium-sized bank... Now, look, um, Silicon Valley was at the larger size of a regional bank, but Signature clearly was not as large, and they've been worried about other banks. I think they've decided in, in, in the short term that having any bank run, which is exactly what we had at Silicon Valley, having any bank run is, is, is not in the best interest of the banking system. You know, the, the, the regulatory community, and, and I'm not gonna blame them because I was a risk manager and we were very good at this as well. The regulatory community and risk managers are very good at managing what they've seen in the past. Therefore, you know, they will come up with regulations that deal what we saw during Silicon Valley Bank but there will be new and different things that happen in the banking system. It, it, it's just the way it naturally is. So I think there are some areas where we can improve oversight of banks, where we can improve regulations of banks. You know, one of them that seems relatively obvious is that we had a bank board. And remember, the bank board are, are the independent fiduciaries for the shareholders. Then the shareholders got wiped out in this bank. That, that help oversee management. We had a bank board at Silicon Valley Bank where I think there was maybe one person on that bank board that understood banking. So it would seem to me that we should hold bank boards to be more accountable and have more knowledge, more information about banking, understand what management is doing. You know, bank boards actually meet with the onsite regulators on an annual basis. And when the regulators come in and talk about what management is doing and what the issues are and what the concerns are, the bank board needs to understand that because they are the ones there that is holding management accountable. And they're the ones whose job is to replace management if management's not doing a good job. So there is going to be some new regulation that comes out of this that will be smart, will be helpful. The key is it can't make small and mid-sized banks uncompetitive because they are the backbone of the U.S. economy. We have to remember that we rely upon small and mid-sized banks to really grow our U.S. economy. Over 50 percent of the loans that go into the U.S. economy come out of these banks, and they are far better equipped to loan into their local economies and understand the businesses than the big global banks and the big, the big multinational banks. Now, the, I want to talk a little bit about that concentration issue. Uh, there was there were some uh, reports over the crisis weekend of March 11th, 12th, that the FDIC, as it was searching for a buyer for Silicon Valley Bank, was discouraging some of the largest institutions uh, from bidding on uh, on the failed bank, uh, for fear of adding to that uh, concentration of the industry, the top heavy nature of it. Was was that a mistake? Uh, and and do we really need more than 4,000? of banks in, uh, in the U.S. There are other advanced economies, as you know, of course, Canada, uh, Japan, others that have a much more concentrated uh, banking system and, and seem to get along uh, just fine. Yeah, David, look, I, I, I think it was a mistake. In a time of crisis, in a time of panic, if there was a natural buyer, which was one of the large systemically important banks, growing those banks by another $200 billion would not have been that big. We're talking about banks. You know, we've got banks in the United States that are over $3 trillion in size. So coming up with a quick and efficient resolution to protect depositors um, and, and have a quick resolution to me makes sense. You know, I agree we have 4,000 banks in the United States. Since Dodd-Frank was, was invoked um, after the 08 financial crisis, We've lost about uh, six, seven hundred banks in the United States. So we were we were closer to five thousand before Dodd Frank. So we're down, you know, about a thousand banks here. Um, I, I agree with you that we don't need as many banks as we have. But again, I'm I, I, I'm going to go on and talk about how important these local banks are. You know, it we have a much more diverse economy than many of these other countries. We have a very large nation 
So when you've got a local bank in a local community and the farmer needs to borrow you know, his million dollars to buy the, the, his new combine, you know, it's going to make a lot of sense for the local banker in that community that understands farming to make that loan. He's going to understand that loan. If you're a large money center bank based in San Francisco or based in New York, you know, I'm not sure you'll have the level of sophistication to, to give that farmer the loan. And I could use small businesses all over the United States as the same example. So I do think we need to keep a, a tiered banking system in the United States. I don't know what the right number of banks is. You know, 4,000 is a lot, but, you know, the, the, the system in Canada of having five or six banks is probably way too few for the United States. Okay. I want to bring in a, a question from a viewer uh, now at, at this point, which I think uh, speaks to some of the populist resentment against banks that certainly you know well uh, coming out of the 2008 uh, crisis. And this uh, comes to us from John Rydell uh, from Rhode Island, and I want to uh, quote him, uh, shouldn't the directors of the failed banks go to jail? Uh, shouldn't bank directors stake their personal wealth against bank failures? What, what would you say to John Rydell of, of Rhode Island? Well, John, look, I, I understand there, there's, there's a lot of anger at banks when they fail. And, and, and I get that. I understand that, that anger. You know, directors of banks are oversight of management. And directors of banks know what they're told by management. They're not employees of banks. They show up at a bank, you know, maybe six times a year. Uh, they have one or two day meetings. They probably have a day of, of committee meetings, which are, you know, compensation committee, audit committee, risk committee, things like that. And then they have a board meeting. Their primary job as a board is to make sure that management is doing their job. I don't think it's practical to hold people that have a different full time job accountable for the for the actual oversight of the bank. Now, look, they, I do believe that they need more information and more knowledge about the banking industry and the financial service industry. And I would like to see that be one of the changes that comes out of this, that some percentage of your board members do have to have banking knowledge, financial service knowledge, and understand the workings of the financial markets. Now, Silicon Valley Bank's failure was felt all the way across the Atlantic Ocean in, in Europe. Uh, where the Swiss banking giant Credit Suisse had to be acquired by its national rival UBS. Uh, there wasn't any obvious link between this regional institution in California and in the heart of uh, tech innovation out there uh, and a, a Swiss uh, banking giant uh, that traced its heritage to 1856. Why? What was the link between the two? Why did the problem in this regional American institution cause uh, headaches all the way over in Europe. Yeah, David, I think there's a little bit of coincidence in here and a little bit of, of causation. You know, the, the, the Credit Suisse situation has been a tough and volatile situation since the 08 financial um, crisis. I don't think that Credit Suisse has recovered. I think they have tried to get themselves on sound financial footings for the last 15 years. And I don't really think they ever got themselves to a sound place. And depositors, having seen what was going on in the United States on Silicon Valley Bank, but other banks, let's, let's not just talk about Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. We saw deposit runs at First Republic. We saw deposit runs at many other regional banks. I think at that moment, people that had assets and deposits at Credit Suisse you know, they got reminded that Credit Suisse still hadn't fully recovered and they, they, they saw a bit of a run on, on assets and deposits. And it was at that point that the Swiss regulators dealt with the problem that they've really been sort of skirting around the edge of for the last 15 years. Fair enough. Let, let's turn to the economic uh, landscape now. And I, I want to start with a, a sort of 30,000 foot level question which deals with the uh, return of geopolitics or the rise of geopolitical risk. Uh, probably since the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine a little more than a year ago, uh, but we've also got U.S.-China relations arguably at their lowest point in decades. Uh, 
uh, just about everywhere you look, uh, if you're a, a global investor or a global uh, corporate executive, you've got things to worry about. Mexico, Israel, France, you name it. Uh, is, the, is the landscape globally for a company like IBM uh, more complicated, more, uh, more troublesome than it was several years ago? And, and how would you say this changed environment uh, affects prospects for your investments, your operations, your plans going forward? David, look, I'm going to talk about all companies. Um, so, so I'll make this generic to all companies. And, and the answer is yes, we're in a very difficult environment for multinational corporations. Uh, and, and look, I think we're in a very difficult environment for companies that are based outside the United States um, to invest in the United States. The United States is also thinking of putting more restrictions on it. We've seen, you know, we all saw the TikTok hearings earlier this week uh, as well. You know, if you look at what's happened in the geopolitical world, you know, every U.S.-based company and basically every every company around the world has ceased their Russian operation. Um, I think justifiably so. The relationships, as you point out, in China and other parts of the world, you know, it, it, it's very it's a very difficult decision uh, to decide how much capital you want to invest in China, how big you want your operations to be. Do you need to diversify out of China? Do you do you, do you not diversify out of China? You know, it's a, it's a very difficult question because you know China's got such a massive population. There, 1.4 billion consumers in China. It's clearly a population that you want to have uh, availability to to sell your products in. Um, so, so it's a market that you can't ignore, and you can also manufacture products there at a competitive advantage to many other parts of the world. So these are tough geopolitical decisions that I think every company is forced to make today. And, and you're right. There's Taiwan issues in the semiconductor industry. You know, the United States went through the CHIPS Act here to you know, so encourage chip manufacturing here in the United States so we wouldn't be as dependent on imported chips from around the world. It's still going to take many years for the U.S. to, to, to get its chip manufacturing up and, and for us to become less, in, less dependent on other parts of the world. And the, these are big issues that are going around the world. And I think every management team and every executive office in every company is thinking about these on a daily basis. Now, even before the, the recent banking uh, turmoil, lenders were starting to tighten up on their credit standards. In the wake of what we've seen at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, uh, and now across the board, what economic impact do you anticipate from that tightening? Yeah. So, so David, as, as I said in the opening clip, look, when banks tighten up and banks don't make loans available, that's a dampening on the U.S. economy. You know, our economy is a credit-driven, consumption-driven economy. We borrow money to do almost everything we do in the United States. We buy a house, we borrow money. We buy a car, we borrow money. We go to college, we get an education, we borrow money. We go out and buy everyday products. We charge them on our credit card, we borrow money. So to the extent that banks are starting to contract their lending, which I think they are because they're hoarding deposits and they have less deposits because many of the deposits have moved to the treasury market, which is paying higher interest rates and has a tax advantage. Banks are being much more conservative and they're lending money to the least risky, risky asset they can find at the highest rate of return. That will have a natural contraction on the U.S. economy. So in essence, the, the banks are doing the Federal Reserve's job for them and slowing down economic growth and slowing down the economy. And I think we're going to see that filter through the economy relatively quickly. And it's a double-edged sword. The good news is that might help the Fed in its fight against inflation. It might also push things too far into a hard landing or a recession. What's your outlook on that score? And was the Fed right to uh, to put through its most recent quarter point uh, increase? David, you're correct. It's, it, it, it's a tougher situation. The Fed, in essence, is outsourcing part of their monetary policy. The Fed understands right now that banks are contracting credit availability and credit's getting more expensive. And they're factoring that into their equation on what economic growth will look like. 
So the Fed is no longer completely in control by pure interest rate policy and quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. They've done a little bit of both recently um, on controlling what inflation looks like. My opinion was in the last meeting, they had to raise by the 25 basis points. You know, prior to the bank uh, bank failures or bank collapses and the, and the, and the bailout of the, of the couple banks in, in, in early March, you know, the Fed had already sort of committed themselves to 50 basis points. The market had priced in 50 basis points. For the Fed to have gone from 50 basis point increase based on the economic data to zero, I think they would have lost credibility. So the, a good compromise position for the Federal Reserve was to end up at 25 basis points. But then in the press conference for Chairman Powell to talk about his understanding of what was going on in the economy, the contraction in credit, um, and the fact that they're quite aware there's a contraction in credit and that they'll be more observant of what's going on and they'll be more economic data uh, dependent going forward. And I think, you know, they've got a month off till the next meeting and they'll see where we are in the economy before they make their next decision. The, the Fed, though, seems to, seems to believe or expect that there'll be at least another rate hike uh, in the future. The market doesn't seem to believe them. In fact, expects rate cuts perhaps by the summer. Uh, who's right? You know, historically, the Fed is right. The mantra in the trading world is never fight the Fed. You know, they've got a big balance sheet. They've got uh, unlimited resources here. You know, the market is taking the view that the economy is going to contract, that the lack of availability of credit and the rate increases that have already happened are going to have a real dampening effect on, on the economy. We're going to slow down significantly, and the Fed is going to be back into a stimulative um, nature by the end of the year. And, and so the market is pricing in cuts. The Fed is still overly concerned, and I don't mean overly. They're justifiably concerned that inflation has not come down. The big factor in inflation right now is labor. You know, right now, we continue to have a, a shortage of labor in the United States. We continue to see wage pressure. And until the Fed sees the labor market soften up and they see wages come down, I think they're going to continue to be vigilant on raising rates until they can see some softness in the labor market. As I've said, we're labor dependent at this point. Yep. Now, in, in looking around the, the uh, landscape for additional potential risks to financial stability, some regulators have pointed to the non-bank uh, financial institutions, hedge funds, insurance companies, uh, open-ended funds, and the like. Uh, how worried should we be that, uh, you know, this is an area that is more opaque than the banking sector in terms of regulation. Uh, how worried should we be that there's a manager or two in that sector that's made the same kind of bad bet on interest rates that blew up Silicon Valley Bank? David, I'm not as concerned. Um, you remember a lot of the funds. So when you talk about the, the 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 mutual funds, or you talk about the money market funds, or you talk about the fixed income funds, they're never short. They're they're long funds. They take um, their clients' money and they buy assets. To the extent they get withdrawals, they need to sell assets and they need to sell assets quickly. So they are somewhat dependent upon the liquidity of the market and the ability for the market to absorb the assets they need to sell. You know, look, if there were a large panic and massive withdrawals from any fund, and I don't care what the underlying asset is, there would be some short-term dislocation. In the hedge funds, you know, they're relatively small compared to the financial markets that they deal in. They are very tightly monitored by their prime brokers. Uh, which are the big money center banks. And, and so I think there's a lot of risk governors on the on the hedge fund industry. But look, we could see small little dislocations in any of these markets if we had a forced liquidation of anything of size. And that goes from equities to fixed income, to currencies, to commodities. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the, the Fed got it wrong on inflation with its transitory call. It's now under fire uh, for failing to prevent uh, or anticipate the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Those are two black marks on Jay Powell's record at the Fed. How do you assess his job performance thus far? Uh, 
Uh, and uh, how do you think the markets see him in, in terms of just that? Look, I, I think it's tough to blame the chairman entirely. Although, look, the chairman gets all the credit when things go wrong. He gets all the blame when, when, when I'd say he gets all the credit when things go right, gets all the blame when things go wrong. I understand that's the risk of, of, of the chairman. The Federal Reserve is a large, enormous institution. And the way the Federal Reserve is set up is we've got, we have regional banks, regional Federal Reserve banks around the country. And those regional banks are the ones responsible for overseeing the banks in, in their district. So Silicon Valley Bank and, and some of the other banks that were having problems were California-based banks regulated by the California regulator. You know, so, so in many essence, you've got to understand how, how the system works. Look, I, I, would, I, I would say that the chairman you know, was, was late, and I've said this before, he was late to the inflation fight. Um, and when you're late to fighting inflation, you have to do more dramatic actions and you have to do them faster. And that clearly was a contribution to these banks um, having, more, having severely underwater portfolios. So had the Federal Reserve you know, fought inflation earlier, they could have come out and raised rates slower. And that would have potentially given banks an opportunity to adjust their portfolio earlier and save them some money. Okay, unfortunately, we are now out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Gary Cohn, thanks for joining us today on Washington Post Live. David, thanks for having me. My pleasure. And thanks to all of you for joining us. To see what we have planned for future programs, head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm David J. Lynch, global economics correspondent here at The Post. Thanks for watching.